Jews celebrate the Passover meal, or, or, or known as the Jewish Seder meal. And, and, and during that meal, the children ask a number of important questions. And, and probably the most important question that is asked is, Ma nishtena hali hazeh? Ma nishtena hali hazeh? And, and that question is, why is this night different than all other nights? And it is up to the leader, the, the, the head of the family, to explain and, and show how each part of the Jewish Seder is another example or another thing to bring remembrance to what it is that God did for the Jews in the Exodus experience. Really, ultimately, what, what the Passover is about is it's remembering God's saving grace. You know, sometimes we think, that saving grace is something that is reserved just for the New Testament. But we would be wrong to think that. We see God's saving grace from the very beginning of the Bible all the way through. The central message of the Bible is the Gospel, of God's saving grace. And we even see it in the Exodus experience. For modern Christians, this question is important also as we consider the Lord's Supper. You know, at, at, at our church, we celebrate the Lord's Supper once a month. And I think it's important that we do that, but unfortunately, I think too often because we become used to it, we don't really reflect on what it means. We don't really reflect on why we're doing this and what our salvation costs. So this morning, I, I want to pause for just a few moments before we partake of the Lord's Supper and consider what it is that we're celebrating and why we celebrate it. So turn with me, if you will, in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Now, of course, the Lord's Supper is a time that we remember the Last Supper as Jesus was together with his disciples before being arrested, going under a mock trial, and then being crucified and put in a grave. We, we do this as a time of remembrance. And the church, really from its infancy, has been coming together to celebrate this time, to celebrate, to remember what it is that Jesus did. In fact, as early as the letters of Paul, the, Paul, the, the letters of Paul are some of the earliest writing that we have from the New Testament. And we see even here in a letter like 1 Corinthians that Paul is dealing with the church that is celebrating the Lord's Supper. But there was a problem. There were many problems in Corinth, but there was a couple of problems in particular. Look at verse 17. It says, but in the following instructions, I do not commend you, because when you come together, it is not for the better, but for the worse. Paul just said something pretty powerful here. He said that when they come together as the church, that they leave worse off. That, that they were actually better if they would have stayed home. Now, now in, a, in an individualistic, consumer-minded culture, we might think, well, well, they were worse off because the sermon wasn't very good. <laughs> they were worse off because they didn't like the music choice that morning. They were worse off because the seats weren't quite what they wanted them to be. They were worse off because they were grumpy because they didn't get their favorite parking spots. Or when they walked in the church, somebody was sitting in their favorite seat. You know, sometimes in our culture today, we make a determination on, on whether a service was good and impactful on how we feel. Was I happy after? Was the sermon a happy, joyful sermon, or was it a sad, challenging sermon? That's not what Paul's getting at. Paul's not focusing on the consumeristic mindset here. He's saying that they're worse off spiritually because of the challenges that they were facing in the church of Corinth. 
because of the, the lack of unity within the church of Corinth, because of the problems that they were having, they were actually leaving worse off. Why is that? Well, let's continue on. Paul says, for in the first place, when you come together as a church, I hear that there are divisions among you, and I believe it in part, for there must be factions among you in order that those who are genuine may be recognized. So Paul, first of all, recognizes that the church is not unified. And he's not surprised by it, unfortunately. He's not surprised by it because he recognizes that there are some in the church of Corinth who are really genuine in their confession of faith, and there's others who are just playing church. Who are just making everybody look like they have this intimate walk with Christ, but they don't. So he goes on and he says, When you come together, it is not the Lord's Supper that you eat. For in eating, each one goes ahead with his own meal. One goes hungry, another gets drunk. What? Do you not have houses to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I commend you for this? No, I will not. Well, let's consider the nature of the issues in Corinth. If we read the entire letter, in fact, if we read both letters, 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians, we can get a good picture of the problems that were going on in the church of Corinth. One of them was there was a lack of unity. The church was not unified. There were a number of reasons for this, but the biggest reasons were having to do with spiritual gifts. People said, well, I've got the gift of prophecy, and we all know the gift of prophecy is the best. Another person said, but I have the gift of tongues, and everybody knows that the gift of tongues makes me more spiritually mature than you. And they were fighting over spiritual gifts. Instead of the spiritual gifts being something like they were intended, pointing people's attention to Christ, people were using it as a way of pointing direction at them. When a church is more focused on individuals and not focused on Christ like we ought to be, even if we make lip service to Christ, if in our hearts we're focused on ourselves, our wants, our desires, what makes us happy, what doesn't make us happy, when we're focused on ourselves, unity will fall apart. It did in Corinth, and it will still today. There was also a problem within Corinth of carnality. By carnality, what I mean is that people were extremely worldly. Corinth was, was, a, was a city that, that would have been a lot like today's Las Vegas. I imagine if they would have had the saying back then, people would have said, what happens in Corinth stays in Corinth. In fact, it was throughout the, 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 Ro the Roman world, what's called the Hellenistic society, people would often say that they were going to Corinthianize. What that meant was that they were going to, to be involved in various different forms of sexual immorality. That was the idea, to Corinthianize. And that's the culture that Corinth was in. And unfortunately, what was happening is many of those practices were seeping into the church. And in fact, in some cases, the church was even celebrating them. Instead of strongly saying, no, this is not God's will. Here's how God wants us to live. People were saying, let's celebrate this. Paul even talks about a, a, a man who had his father's wife and was taking her as his own wife. Paul recognized that carnality had seeped into the church. And you know, unfortunately, in many cases, it happens with us too today. It happens with us too today. Too many of us are in love with the world. Too many of us will, will ignore sinful lifestyles, sinful practices, because we don't want to hurt people's feelings. We don't want to upset people. We don't want to make people mad. What happens when we do that? We start letting carnality reach, in, reach its hand into the church. Another problem is there was a tax on Paul. A lot of people in Corinth didn't like what Paul would say. Paul was very blunt in his preaching. He was not what we would call a user-friendly preacher. <laughs> and so, because people couldn't deal with the truth that Paul was teaching, what did they do? They attacked Paul. 
Don't like what he's teaching? Can't argue with it? But let me attack him. He's not a real apostle. He didn't even really know Jesus. Why should we have to listen to him? And on and on they went. These were the problems that we were that they were facing in Corinth. Paul focuses here specifically on an issue dealing with unity and carnality. That having to do with the Lord's Supper. Paul gets into some specifics here. He says, for in eating, each one goes ahead with his own meal. One goes hungry, another gets drunk. What? Do you not have houses to eat in and drink in? Now, what exactly is going on here? To the best of what we can see, as we look historically and we look across all of Paul's letters to the church in Corinth, what was going on there is there was multiple splits. Not just because of spiritual gifts, but also because of socioeconomic lines. And what it looks like was going on here was that when they would come together, their, their Lord's Supper celebration was very different than ours. Okay? They would have what we would call, in essence, a potluck. They called it a love feast. But instead of like a, a good Baptist potluck, because you know what we do as Baptists, we bring a covered dish, right? In fact, I, I think most Baptists believe that we've got to show up to the pearly gates with a covered dish. <laughs> Otherwise, we can't get in, right? It's not a potluck where you bring food and everybody shares it together. People would bring what in essence would be like a sack lunch. Okay? Now, don't anybody go, I didn't even know they had paper bags back then. <laughs> okay, metaphor. They would bring their own food. And those who were wealthy had lots of food, and those who were poor had nothing. And they wouldn't share with one another, and they wouldn't even wait for one another. Many of those who were wealthy would show up early because they wanted to eat and they didn't want to be around those poor people. They didn't want those poor people looking at them while they were eating. What's the best thing to do? Show up to church earlier. Then they don't have to look at me, right? People were bringing ungodly, worldly practices and social patterns into the church and even calling them sacred. People were hurting the unity of the church because they were self-centered. For them, the church had become about them. And their wants and their needs. And not on Christ. Why is this such an issue? It's such an issue because the self-centered attitudes of the people, especially the rich, took the focus away from Christ and further damage the unity of the church. Now we may look at that and go, whew, that means I'm safe because I'm anywhere from, I'm far from rich. No. We need to recognize that this ought to speak to every single one of us. Because the reality is, is it is so easy to take the focus off of Christ and put it squarely on ourselves. In fact, we live in an individualistic culture where many, even many in the church, have believed that, that the church is there to appeal to my wants, my desires, what you got for me. And unfortunately, we become very self-centered, focused on ourselves instead of Christ. So what's the solution? The solution Paul deals with starting in verse 23. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, also, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. What is Paul's solution for the church in Corinth? What, what, Paul laid out the problem, so what's the solution? The solution Paul lays out here is the centrality of the Lord Jesus Christ in worship. The centrality of the Lord Jesus Christ in worship. The solution to the issue was to take the focus off of themselves 
and to put it squarely on Christ Jesus and His finished work on the cross. That was the solution. That's why Paul lays out what it is that Jesus showed him that the Lord's Supper was all about. First of all, it was a time of remembrance. And it's still a time of remembrance. It's a time to come together and not focus on ourselves, not focus on our issues, but to focus on the centrality of the Lord Jesus Christ and what He did. You know, when we come and celebrate the Lord's Supper, we all come from different backgrounds and different experiences, different challenges, different victories. Some of us come with great pain in our hearts. And God doesn't say, just dump all that stuff. What He says is the solution is to focus on Christ Jesus, of the centrality of Christ Jesus in everything. It's a time of remembrance. Remember what Jesus has done. It's also a time of proclamation. It's a time that we proclaim to all what Jesus has done for us. What He's done for us in the cross. What He's done for us through the work of His Holy Spirit in our hearts. It's a time of proclamation. It's also a time of unity. It's a time that we ought to come together as a church and be more unified. See, but, but there's problems in the church. Guess what? There's always going to be problems in the church because there's people in the church. People have issues, right? We all do. But it's a time to be unified together. Why? Because as we come together, we are not perfect people. But what we are is grace recipients. We are people who have received great grace. So let's talk about some of the implications of proper and improper observance. Look at what he says in verse 27. Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of profaning the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then and so eat the bread and drink the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body, eats and drinks judgment on himself. That is why many of you are weak and ill, and some have died. But if we were judged ourselves truly, we would not be judged. But when we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined so that we may not be condemned along with the world. So then, my brothers, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. If anyone is hungry, let him eat at home, so that when you come together, it will not be for judgment. About other things, I will give directions when I come. Well, there's a few things that, that Paul says here that, that we ought to focus some attention on. First of all, he talks about unworthy observance. What in the world is he talking about when he says unworthy observance? Okay? And I, I don't know about you, but when I think about something that we do in church, if I heard you're doing an unworthy observance, I would, from God, I would want to know... Okay, what? What is that? How can we stop that? What is he talking about here? Well, first of all, let's talk about what it isn't. What it isn't. He's not saying that we are unworthy to eat or drink of the elements in the Lord's Supper because of sin or issues in our lives. It's important that we grab a hold of that. I know when I was a, a young Christian, I, I dealt with a besetting sin. And a lot of the things that I was involved in in my life, when I became a Christian, I was, I was, you know what, I don't have any interest in that anymore. But I had a couple of things that I struggled with. And I struggled with it so much that I felt like I was not worthy to partake of the Lord's Supper. And so I didn't. For the longest time, I just let it pass by me. I learned something, though, as I grew older. Christ has made us worthy through His sacrificial atonement. We are never worthy because of our works, good or bad. We're not worthy because of our good works or unworthy because of our bad works. It's because of Christ's finished work on the cross that we ever have hope of standing before God worthy. 
Because when God looks at us, He doesn't see a wretched sinner. He sees a man or a woman, a, a, a young man or a young woman or a child. He sees us as people who are covered with the blood of Christ. He sees us as His adopted children washed by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. As we come together, He's not saying that if you have sin in your life, that you have to not partake of it. If you have sin in your life, repent. If you have sin in your life, what a perfect opportunity as you examine yourself to say, Lord, I need help. Lord, this is an area where I have fallen short. Help me, Lord. Break my heart, Lord. So what is it? What is Paul talking about? Okay, remember the situation. The situation that was going on. Okay? The first part of their unworthy observance was that they were doing it irreverently. Irreverently. Contextually, it would seem to suggest here that they were partaking of it divided across social and economical lines. Paul is saying, that's irreverent. Why? Well, let's get to the heart of that. Because really, we can expand it from there. We, we, we don't say, well, I guess our, our observance is worthy because we're, we're not divided across socioeconomic lines here. Okay? Let's expand that to get to the heart of what he's talking about here. Any time that the focus of the Lord's Supper is about anything other than doing it in remembrance of Christ and proclaiming His death until He comes, that is irreverent. Any time the focus of our worship gets off of Christ and gets on to us, it's irreverent. There are a few things that God will never share. The most important thing that God will never share is worship. In fact, if God ever shared His worship with any of us, God would sin. Because He is the only one in the entire universe that is worthy of worship. And so any time that we make worship about us and our stuff, we're risking being irreverent. Because we think it's about us. We want to make it all about us. And we become no different than the church of Corinth. But it doesn't end there. Paul also says that they were failing to discern the body. Now what in the world is he talking about as he talks about failing to discern the body? Is he saying that we're failing to focus on Christ? In part, yes. But as he talks about the body, unless he connects it with the blood... Usually he's talking about the body of Christ as a whole, the church. So in failing to discern the body, what he's saying is they were focusing so much attention on themselves and failing to focus on Christ that they were creating a situation where the unity within the church is broken down. They were failing to recognize that their behavior had consequences for the entire body of Christ. Their selfish self-centeredness, their irreverent spirit was breaking up the unity of the body. What are the outcomes? Well, first of all, we see discipline. Discipline. You know, the reality is, sometimes our actions have real-life consequences, don't we? We live in a time where a lot of people who are believers will say, well, I'm covered with grace. And that is true. Praise God for His grace. Amen? Amen. Praise God that none of us have ever, deserved, have ever received what our sin deserved. Praise God for that. But the reality is, is that sometimes, in fact, oftentimes, our sin has consequences. Our sin has consequences. Not a popular statement today, but it's a true statement. And it's not that God is punishing us per se. Remember, discipline. God's discipline is not punitive. If God's discipline is punitive, then we would have no hope. 
Jesus faced the punitive wrath of God on the cross for us. But what Christ's discipline always is, is it leads us to repentance. It leads us to growth. It leads us to be more Christ-like. Is it painful? Yes. Now Paul talks here about some being sick. He says, For if anyone eats and drinks without discerning the body, he eats and drinks judgment on himself. That is why many of you are weak and ill, and some have died. Now we might read that and go, wait a minute, does that mean that if we don't participate in the Lord's Supper correctly, that we're going to get sick and die? Well, let's be careful. Okay? Let's be careful. Okay? There is a slippery slope there that we can be very, uh, that we can fall down on. Okay? If we assume that bad things are always the result of bad actions, and that good things are a result of good actions, then we become no different than the Pharisees of old who want to justify themselves before God for our godly behavior. If we have that attitude, then grace is negated. It's not about grace, it's about how good we can be. And that's wrong. Grace tells us a very different story. It says none of us are worthy because all of us have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But God's grace offers us the opportunity to repent and be forgiven. Now, why is Paul talking about sickness? Because as the church became so focused on themselves, as they became so irreverent, as they became so ununified, there are a few things I'm sure that were happening. One is that people were stressed out. What happens when we get upset at one another in the church? We just kind of go about our life and go, oh yeah, no big deal, right? No, we get upset. It, 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 for me, when I know somebody's mad at me, well, for the right reasons, when I know somebody's mad at me, it twists my knot, my stomach into knots. And I, and I stress out. And sometimes I, I miss sleep over it. When I've had people mad at me, especially when they've been mad at me for, for dumb things I've done, it bothers me. And that stress, when it builds up, what's it going to do to us? It has effects on our body, doesn't it? But I think even more so than that, when a church is not unified together, a church stops praying for one another. If we pray for one another, it sounds like this, Lord, change their mind before I do. We fail to pray for one another. We spend more time praying for ourselves. Lord, help me in this situation with this person I can't stand instead of praying for one another. I believe that's what was happening in the church of Corinth. They weren't praying for one another. They were fighting with one another. And what happened? It's no Paul also talks about God's judgment. Can people get sick and even die because of God's judgment? The answer is yes. Yes, they can. So the best way to look at this text is to recognize that I don't want to test it. I don't want to test to see. Some will say, well, God's not going to do this to people. You want to test that yourself? I think it's better to do it God's way and not even ask the question. My mom used to like to say, boy, actually when my mom was mad at me, I could tell, okay, if she'd say Ben, I knew I had to listen. If she said Benjamin, raising a level. If she said Benjamin Trigstead, and then the coup de gras, Benjamin Ambrose Trigstead, I knew it was time to put together my last will and testament. My mom used to like to say, I brought you into this world, and I can take you out of this world. <laughs> now, I don't know if my mom would really take me out of this world, but you know what? I never tested it. <laughs> I don't need to know, because it's enough to know that my mom was serious. So what's a worthy? 
We've seen what an unworthy observance is. What is a worthy observance? Well, discerning the body. Paul says it right here. He says, for if anyone eats and, eat and drinks without discerning the body, he eats and drinks judgment on himself. What does that mean? Well, we've already laid it out. Are we observing the Lord's Supper reverently? Is our focus on Christ and not on ourselves? Are we remembering that the unity of the church matters more than me? And my feelings and my likes and my wants and what I'm frustrated about? Are we focused on Christ and the body of Christ? Or are we focused on ourselves? What's the outcome? What are the outcomes when we have a worthy observance? First of all, we honor God. You know, my prayer every single week is that our service will be honoring to God. That should be what our desire is with everything in our life. Not, is it going to be the biggest and best? It's not, it's not is everybody going to see it and go, wow, what a sermon. Wow, what a worship service. No. Is this honoring to God? When we come together and we celebrate the Lord's Supper for the right reasons, in the right way, we honor God. We honor God. We also foster unity. We foster unity within the church with one another. How do we accomplish that? Well, we need to examine ourselves. Look what Paul says. He says, let each person examine himself then, so and eat the bread and drink the cup. We, as we celebrate the Lord's Supper, we ought to be examining ourselves. We ought to be looking in our heart. Is there something in me that's making everything about me? If it is, don't say, well, I can't partake. Repent. Is there an issue that we have with our brothers and sisters in Christ? Make it right. Now, I'm not saying get right up in the middle of the Lord's Supper and say, I've got a problem with you. We've got to make it right right now. But make a mental note. I'm going to take the Lord's Supper and then I'm going to go talk to this person. That's bold. And that's difficult. And sometimes it's painful. But it's always worth it. And then judge yourself. By judge yourself, it's more than just examine yourself. Sometimes we're good at saying, this is a problem in my life. This is something I need help with. All right, let me go back to what I was doing before. Okay? When we judge ourselves, what we're saying is, I need to do something about this. I need to make this right. So what does all this mean for us? As we celebrate the Lord's Supper each month, I want us to think about four things. First of all, let's prepare and examine ourselves. There are few things more sacred that the church does than observing the Lord's Supper. And it should be approached seriously and reverently. It should focus on Jesus and His victory won on the cross and not on ourselves. I believe that we ought to prepare ourselves even the night before as we pray. Preparing our hearts for what He's going to say to us. It's wise during the, the Lord's Supper to just take, to, to try to put yourself in your mind's eye in your head. Try to put yourself back on that faithful night Sit around the table with the Lord Jesus and the disciples. You have an advantage that they didn't have. They didn't understand what was about to happen. You know because you have it in the Word. Think about the significance of what Jesus says when He says, this is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And when He says, this, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. You know what that means. You understand. Then partake. Partake of the Lord's Supper. Proclaiming Christ's death until He comes. You know, what we see in here is not simply a command to be nice people. Especially to be nice to the poor. It's a call for us to reflect and recall God's transformative grace. Considering the cost of our salvation. As we partake of the bread and the juice, we ought to remember what Christ's salvation cost. Next, and leading right into it, focus on Christ and His finished work for you. 
Just as the Passover meal was a time for Jews to remember the Exodus experience, so the Lord's Supper is a time for believers to come together and remembering the atonement for our sins that was won on the cross by Christ Jesus. Are you celebrating the Lord's Supper or your own? Is it just something you do? Because we do it all the time. I believe that if we focus on anything other than Christ at our Lord's Supper celebration, we commit blasphemy. Because we're saying that it's about me. And it never was. I love what Craig, Craig Blomberg writes. He says, only when the Lord returns will cross-centered Christianity become redundant. What we do in the Lord's Supper is never redundant. It is a time to remember what Jesus has done. It's a time to remember that each and every one of us are grace recipients. As we take the elements, think about this. You are a grace recipient. You receive grace not because you deserve it, not because there's anything intrinsically good about you, but just simply because God loves you. We are grace recipients. Next. Remember, we're proclaiming Christ. We're not proclaiming ourselves. We're not proclaiming our church. We're not proclaiming our denomination. We proclaim Christ Jesus when we take the Lord's Supper. We say, this is who I believe. This is who I put my faith in. This is who I follow. The one who sacrificed it all for me. Finally, draw closer together with your fellow grace recipients. You know, the unity of the church is based on so many things. But one of the quickest ways for us to be unified together as a church is to recognize that everybody sitting in this room right now who has received Jesus as Savior, is a grace recipient. Are we the same? No. We have different backgrounds, different education levels, different cultural backgrounds, different ways that we were raised, different viewpoints, different political outlooks, different desires for life. There's so many things that are different about us. But you know what makes us sane? Is that we all have received grace. We all have received God's unmerited favor. A favor that we didn't earn and could never earn. Why are we unified? We're unified because we're all receivers of grace. Amazing, abundant, indescribable <coughs> grace. And that should draw us together. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you and praise you.